The conservative Supreme Court has just handed religious zealots a massive victory in the state of Texas, uh, but also across the country in failing to block an anti-abortion law in the state of Texas, which effectively bans abortions past six weeks. Now, the thing that makes this law uh, pretty tricky is the way it's written. And uh, what the state lawmakers in Texas really capitalized on here is the idea that the state won't enforce the ban. It'll be private citizens who are enticed by a $10,000 reward um, who will essentially bring civil suits against anyone in the state who aids or abets uh, an abortion or what they deem to be an illegal abortion. Now, the whole idea is to suck out all the resources from the uh, few remaining uh, abortion clinics in the state of Texas because they're going to be stuck battling in all these cases. Uh, they're going to be tied up in litigation. It'll very likely bankrupt them regardless of whether the suits brought forward are frivolous. And so in response to the Supreme Court's decision to avoid blocking it for now, as the case works its way in the lower courts, um, Abortion clinics essentially say, no, we're, uh, we have to cancel all appointments because whether the abortion is legal or not, we know we're going to have to deal with um, these anti-choice activists who are literally standing outside of our clinics right now waiting for an opportunity to file claims against us. And I should also note, uh, there were roughly 40 abortion clinics in the state of Texas back in 2013. Uh, because of previous anti-abortion laws that passed in that state, uh, they're down to 24. So from 40 to 24. And this is about much more than reproductive rights. This is about women's health. Uh, this is about medical privacy rights, um, and also just the ramifications for other constitutional rights in the future. So Paul, um, just right off the bat, what were your thoughts on this? I mean, it, it's incredible. And, and it really kind of speaks to like how it's easy, or at least for me, sometimes to become become complacent about certain rights that we've won. And, you know, it's like, of course, I've, I've known that, you know, in certain states, abortion rights are under more attack than others or more vulnerable. But you kind of reach a point where like, you know, there's no way they could go that far, right? There's no way we could ever overturn Roe v. Wade. And it just really, which we haven't totally done yet, but I mean, that kind of seems like this is like a path towards that. Um, so I really kind of speak to like, no progress is inevitable. Like we can't take gains for granted. You know, you know, we, for example, I would never think the Civil Rights Act could be overturned, but I mean, who the hell knows these days? So um, yeah, I mean, it's disturbing. And I think I really wonder how um, you know abortion rights advocates are going to be responding to this? Given like it's very clear we can't rely on the, the courts anymore. So will that move to a different stage of activism of civil disobedience? Um, so I'm curious to see like what the response from activists will be to this. Yeah, absolutely, and and what the response from Congress will be because uh, while there might be some ridiculous arbitrary rules like the Senate filibuster in place. Uh, the filibuster could be thrown out and Democrats could pass uh, a law, federal law uh, codifying uh, the protections for female reproductive rights. Uh, but the question is, do they have the willingness to do that? And uh, we'll ask David Sirota about it during our interview segment today. Um, but I also wanted to give you guys um, some more details about what happened, because the Supreme Court, through what's referred to as their shadow docket, did not rule on the constitutionality of the law. They just argued that we're not going to block it in, in like one paragraph. We're not going to block it. We're just going to let this play out in the courts um, and see where it goes. The Supreme Court's vote was five to four with Chief Justice John Roberts joining the court's three liberal members in dissent. And also, uh, just to be clear, the majority opinion was unsigned and consisted of a single long paragraph. It said the abortion providers who had challenged the law in an emergency application to the court had not made their uh, case in the face of complex and novel procedural questions. The majority stressed that it was not ruling on the constitutionality of the Texas law and did not mean to limit procedurally proper challenges to it. Except, I mean, they, they certainly did do that. And Justice Sonia Sotomayor, uh, you know, responded. Every liberal justice wrote their own dissent. Uh, she argues that the court's order is stunning, 
presented with an application to enjoin a flagrantly unconstitutional law engineered to prohibit women from exercising their constitutional rights and evade judicial scrutiny, a majority of justices have opted to bury their heads in the sand. The court has rewarded the state's effort to delay federal review of a plainly unconstitutional statute enacted in disregard of the court's precedents through procedural entanglements of the state's own creation. The court should not be so content to ignore its constitutional obligations to protect not only the rights of women, but also the sanctity of its precedents and of the rule of law. And so I, I look, this again isn't just about abortion rights. Um, this is something that can impact literally every constitutional right we have if the Supreme Court or the federal courts uphold this law. Because if the state can say, well, I mean, if the state engaged in the enforcement, then we would be, you know, violating constitutional rights. If private citizens are doing the enforcement, then no constitutional rights have been violated. Like that's the argument they're using. And that could apply to anything, by the way, right. including to uh, Republican priorities. And in a way, it's like I, won't, I almost don't know what is scarier, like the state coming in and enforcing it or just empowering citizens to like do it for them. I mean, both are obviously very scary, but it, I don't even know to say what's scarier. And I think <clears throat> this is kind of like a broader dilemma we face on the left of how much do we focus on these political institutions like the Supreme Court and the Senate, which we know in many ways are like inherently hostile to us. Their procedures are set up to block progress. So on the one hand, you know, I kind of sympathize with we shouldn't waste our time worrying about every Supreme Court appointment and all this sort of thing. But on the other hand, the right wing over the long term has worried about these things. They've made sure they have their people in place um, to do these things. So, you know, and, and this this situation is an example of like these things actually do matter. Um, but it's a hard balance. Like I don't have an easy answer because I think there's a danger of us getting lost in the sauce of like analyzing everything about the Supreme Court or every appointment. But at the same time, we just can't ignore it. And it does matter. Yeah, I think what the right wing in America has, other than funding <laughs> that the left yeah, that helps. does not yeah. have, is the willingness to engage and coalesce around these long term projects. Um, there's a lot of division in the left right now regarding, um, you know, the long-term projects that really we need because there are no shortcuts. So, you know, people look at the idea of organizing and empowering labor as like something that's just going to take too long. We don't have time. And I get that, but really, I mean, what other option is there? I mean, we could look at the successful case study on the right and maybe utilize some of their tactics. Although I do also admit that the left has certain disadvantages that the right wing does not have, including the issue of funding and all of that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think that, you know, only relying on electoral strategy or only relying on theater or like, I don't know, poorly organized boycotts and things like that, it's not going to get us anywhere. And I think we've right. kind of seen that. And the problem, and hopefully I'm not preempting you here, I know there's a tweet from Sirota about what the Democrats could do about this, but the problem also for us is that those that are on our side, kind of, that are in power, that do have power, are not using it. So like, you know, we, we do have, Democrats do have a majority in Congress, there are certain things they can do, and are not doing it. And then, to me, that fuels this very dangerous cycle of like, they're doing that, so then it's like, why should we care about our institutions? Mm -hmm. Why should we be voting if if the whole idea is premised on these people have power to do things and they're not going to do it, why should we care? Um, so there's no easy answer. I mean, it's just a really big dilemma that, you know, we we try to fall in line when we're supposed to. Let's elect Biden. Let's get a Democratic majority. And then we're not seeing the action that they can take, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I'm really looking forward to having that conversation um, with Sirota. Uh, I do want to know what uh, the progressive lawmakers in the House are planning to do in regard to, you know, withholding their vote in, in a specific circumstance where it makes a lot of sense to do so. If you enjoyed this video from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. That way, you'll enjoy all of our backlog, as well as all of our future content, including interviews, live streams, and clips. Thank you.